Section number 32 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 32. Orestes Augustus Brownson, 1803-1876, by Charles Dudley Warner. Orestes Brownson, in his time, was a figure of striking originality and influence in American literature, and American political, philosophical, and religious discussion. His career was an exceptional one for he was connected with some of the most important contemporaneous movements of thought and passed through several distinct phases presbyterianism universalism socialism of a mild and benevolent kind not to be confused with the later fiery and destructive socialism of the reds after sympathizing somewhat with the aims and tendencies of the new england transcendentalists a close intellectual associate of ralph waldo emerson then the apostle of a new christianity finally becoming a roman catholic coming of old connecticut stock on his father's side he was born in vermont september sixteenth eighteen o three and notwithstanding that he was brought up in poverty on a farm with small opportunity for education contrived in later years to make himself a thorough scholar in various directions mastering several languages acquiring a wide knowledge of history reading deeply in philosophy and developing marked originality in setting forth new philosophical views his bent in childhood was strongly religious and he even believed at that period of his life that he held long conversations with the sacred personages of holy scripture yet while in manhood he devoted many years and much of his energy to preaching his character was aggressive and his tone controversial he however revealed many traits of real gentleness and humility and the mixture of rugged strength and tenderness in his character and his work won him a large following in whatever position he took he performed the remarkable feat when the support of american letters was slight of founding and conducting almost single-handed from eighteen thirty eight to eighteen forty three his famous quarterly review which was a power in the land he started it again in eighteen forty four as brownson's quarterly review and resumed it thirty years later in still a third series he died in eighteen seventy six at detroit much of his active career having been passed in boston and some of his later years at seton hall new jersey his various changes of belief have often been taken as an index of vacillation but a simple and candid study of his writings shows that such changes were merely the normal progress of an intensely earnest and sincere mind which never hesitated to avow his honest convictions nor to admit its errors this is a quality which gives brownson his vitality as a mind and an author and he will be found to be consistent with conscience throughout his writings are forceful, eloquent, and lucid in style, with a Websterian massiveness that does not detract from their charm. They fill twenty volumes, divided into groups of essays on civilization, controversy, religion, philosophy, scientific theories, and popular literature, which cover a great and fascinating variety of topics in detail. Brownson was an intense and patriotic American, and his national quality comes out strongly in his extended treatise, The American Republic, 1865. The best known of his other works is a candid, vigorous, and engaging autobiography entitled The Convert, 1853. Saint Simonism from The Convert 
if i drew my doctrine of union in part from the eclecticism of cousin i drew my views of the church and of the reorganization of the race from saint simonians a philosophico religious or a politico philosophical sect that sprung up in france under the restoration and figured largely for a year or two under the monarchy of july their founder was claude henry count de st simon a descendant of the du de st simon well known as the author of the memoirs he was born in seventeen sixty entered the army at the age of seventeen and the year after came to this country where he served with distinction in our revolutionary war under boulet after the peace of seventeen eighty three he devoted two years to the study of our people and institutions and then returned to france hardly had he returned before he found himself in the midst of the french revolution which he regarded as the practical application of the principles or theories adopted by the reformers of the sixteenth century and popularized by the philosophers of the eighteenth he looked upon that revolution we are told as having only a destructive mission necessary important but inadequate to the wants of humanity and instead of being carried away by it as were most of the young men of his age and his principles he set himself at work to amass materials for the erection of a new social edifice on the ruins of the old which should stand and improve in solidity strength grandeur and beauty for ever the way he seems to have taken to amass these materials was to engage with a partner in some grand speculations for the accumulation of wealth and speculations too it is said not of the most honorable or even the most honest character his plan succeeded for a time and he became very rich as did many others in those troubled times but he finally met with reverses and lost all but the wrecks of his fortune he then for a number of years plunged into all manner of vice and indulged to excess in every species of dissipation not we are told from love of vice any inordinate desire or any impure affection but for the holy purpose of preparing himself by his experience for the great work of redeeming man and securing for him a paradise on earth having gained all that experience could give him in the department of vice he then proceeded to consult the learned professors of l'ecole polytechnique for seven or ten years to make himself master of science literature and the fine arts in all their departments and to place himself at the level of the last attainments of the race thus qualified to be the founder of a new social organization he wrote several books in which he deposited the germs of his ideas or rather the germs of the future most of which have hitherto remained unpublished but now that he was so well qualified for his work he found himself a beggar and had as yet made only a single disciple he was reduced to despair and attempted to take his own life but failed the ball only grazed his sacred forehead his faithful disciple was near him saved him and aroused him into life and hope when he recovered he found that he had fallen into a gross error he had been a materialist an atheist and had discarded all religious ideas as long since outgrown by the human race he had proposed to organize the human race with materials furnished by the senses alone and by the aid of positive science he owns his fault and conceives and brings forth a new christianity consigned to a small pamphlet entitled nuevo christianisme which was immediately published this done his mission was ended and he died may nineteenth eighteen twenty five and i suppose was buried saint simon the preacher of a new christianity very soon attracted disciples chiefly from the pupils of the polytechnic school ardent and lively young men full of enthusiasm brought up without faith in the gospel and yet unable to live without religion of some sort among the active members of the sect were at one time pierre leroux 
Jules and Michael Chevalier, Lerminier, and my personal friend, Dr. Poyen, who initiated me and so many others in New England into the mysteries of animal magnetism. Dr. Poyen was, I believe, a native of the island of Guadeloupe, a man of more ability than he usually had credit for, of solid learning, genuine science, and honest intentions. I knew him well and esteemed him highly. When I knew him, his attachment to the new religion was much weakened, and he often talked to me of the old church, and assured me that he felt at times that he must return to her bosom. I owed him many hints which turned my thoughts toward Catholic principles, and which, with God's grace, were of much service to me. These and many others were in the sect, whose chiefs, after the death of its founder, were Bazard, a liberal and practical man who killed himself, and Infantine, who after the dissolution of the sect sought employment in the service of the Viceroy of Egypt, and occupies now some important post in connection with the French railways. The sect began in 1826 by addressing the working classes, but their success was small. In 1829 they came out of their narrow circle, assumed a bolder tone, addressed themselves to the general public, and became in less than 18 months a Parisian modé. In 1831 they purchased the Globe newspaper, made it their organ, and distributed gratuitously 5,000 copies daily. In 1832 they had established a central propagandism in Paris and had their missionaries in most of the departments of France. They attacked the hereditary peerage, and it fell. They seemed to be numerous and strong, and I believed for a moment in their complete success. They called their doctrine a religion, their ministers priests, and their organization a church, and as such they claimed to be recognized by the state and to receive from it a subvention as other religious denominations did. But the courts decided that St. Simonism was not a religion, and its ministers were not religious teachers. This decision struck them with death. Their prestige vanished. They scattered, dissolved in thin air, and went off, as Carlyle would say, into endless vacuity, as do sooner or later all shams and unrealities. St. Simon himself, who as presented to us by his disciples, is a half-myth personage, seems, so far as I can judge by those of his writings that I have seen, to have been a man of large ability and laudable intentions. But I have not been able to find any new or original thoughts of which he was the indisputable father. His whole system, if system he had, is summed up in the two maxims, Eden is before us, not behind us, or the golden age of the poets is in the future, not in the past, and society ought to be so organized as to tend in the most rapid manner possible to the continuous moral, intellectual, and physical amelioration of the poorer and more numerous classes. He simply adopts the doctrine of progress set forth with so much flash eloquence by Condorcet, and the philanthropic doctrine with regard to the laboring classes or the people, defended by Barbouf and a large section of the French revolutionists. His religion was not so much as the theophilanthropy attempted to be introduced by some members of the French directory. It admitted God in name, and in name did not deny Jesus Christ, but it rejected all mysteries and reduced religion to mere socialism. It conceded that Catholicity had been the true church down to the pontificate of Leo X, because down to that time its ministers had taken the lead in directing the intelligence and labors of mankind had aided the progress of civilization, and promoted the well-being of the poorer and more numerous classes, had leagued itself with the ruling orders, and lent all its influence to uphold tyrants and tyranny. A new church was needed. 
a church which should realize the ideal of jesus christ and tend directly and constantly to the moral physical and social amelioration of the poorer and more numerous classes in other words the greatest happiness in this life of the greatest number the principle of jeremy bentham and his utilitarian school his disciples enlarged upon the hints of the master and attributed to him ideas which he never entertained they endeavored to reduce his hints to a complete system of religion philosophy and social organization their chiefs i have said were amand bazard and bartholome prosper and fontaine bazard took the lead in what related to the external political and economic organization and infantine in what regarded doctrine and worship the philosophy or theology of the sect or school was derived principally from hegel and was a refined pantheism its christology was the unity not union of the divine and human and the incarnation symbolized the unity of god and man or the divinity manifesting himself in humanity and making humanity substantially divine the very doctrine and reality which i myself had embraced even before i had heard of the saint simonians if not before they had published it the religious organization was founded on the doctrine of the progressive nature of man and the maxim that all institutions should tend in the most speedy and direct manner possible to the constant amelioration of the moral intellectual and physical condition of the poorer and more numerous classes socially men were to be divided into three classes artists savants and industrialists or working men corresponding to the psychological division of the human faculties the soul has three powers or faculties to love to know and to act those in whom the love faculty is predominant belong to the class of artists those in whom the knowledge faculty is predominant belong to the class of savants the scientific and the learned and in fine those in whom the act faculty predominates belong to the industrial class this classification places every man in the social category for which he is fitted and to which he is attracted by his nature these several classes are to be hierarchically organized under chiefs or priests who are respectively priests of the artists of the scientific and of the industrials and are priests and all to be subjected to a supreme father pari supreme and a supreme mother mere supreme the economical organization is to be based on the maxims to each according to his capacity and to each according to his work private property is to be retained but its transmission by inheritance or testamentary disposition must be abolished the property is to be held by a tenure resembling that of gavel kind it belongs to the community and the priests chiefs and brehons as the celtic tribes call them to distribute it for life to individuals and to each individual according to his capacity it was supposed that in this way the advantages of both common and individual property might be secured something of this prevailed originally in most nations and a reminiscence of it still exists in the village system among the slavonic tribes of russia and poland and nearly all jurists maintain that the testamentary right by which a man disposes of his goods after his natural death as well as that by which a child inherits from the parent is a municipal not a natural right the most striking feature of the saint simonian scheme was the rank and position it assigned to woman it asserted the absolute equality of the sexes and maintained that either sex is incompatible 
without the other. Man is an incomplete individual without woman. Hence a religion, a doctrine, a social institution founded by one sex alone is incomplete and can never be adequate to the wants of the race or a definite order. This idea was also entertained by Francis Wright and appears to be entertained by all our women's rights folk of either sex. The old civilization was masculine, not male and female, as God made them, hence its condemnation. The St. Simonians therefore proposed to place by the side of their sovereign father at the summit of their hierarchy a sovereign mother. The man to be sovereign father they found, but a woman to be sovereign mother, Mare Supreme, they found not. This caused great embarrassment and a split between Bazard and Enfantine. Bazard was about to marry his daughter, and he proposed to place her marriage under the protection of the existing French laws. Enfantine opposed his doing so, and called it a sinful compliance with the prejudices of the world. The St. Simonian society, he maintained, was a state, a kingdom within itself, and should be governed by its own laws and its own chiefs, without any recognition of those without. Bazard persisted, and had the marriage of his daughter solemnized in a legal manner, and for aught I know, according to the rites of the church. A great scandal followed. Bazard charged Enfantine with denying Christian marriage and withholding loose notions on the subject. Enfantine replied that he neither denied nor affirmed Christian marriage that in enacting the existing laws on the subject man alone had been consulted and he could not recognize it as law till woman had given her consent to it as yet the society was only provisionally organized inasmuch as they had not yet found the mere supreme the law on marriage must emanate conjointly from the supreme father and the supreme mother and it would be irregular and a usurpation of the Supreme Father to undertake alone to legislate on the subject. Bazard would not submit, and went out and shot himself. Most of the politicians abandoned the association, and Puri and Fantine, almost in despair, dispatched twelve apostles to Constantinople to find in the Turkish harems the Supreme Mother. After a year they returned and reported that they were unable to find her, and the society, condemned by the French courts as immoral, broke up, and broke up because no woman could be found to be its mother. And so they ended, having risen, flourished, and decayed in less than a single decade. The points in the St. Simonian movement that attracted my attention and commanded my belief where what it will seem strange to my readers could ever have been doubted. Its assertion of a religious future for the human race, and that religion in the future as well as in the past must have an organization, and a hierarchical organization. Its classification of men according to the predominant psychological faculty in each, into artists, savants, and industrials struck me as very well, and the maxims, to each according to his capacity, and to each according to its works, as evidently just and desirable if practicable. The doctrine of the divinity in humanity, of progress, of no essential antagonism between the spiritual and the material, and of the duty of shaping all institutions for the speediest and continuous moral, intellectual, and physical amelioration of the poorer and more numerous classes I already held. I was rather pleased than otherwise with the doctrine with regard to property, and thought it a decided improvement on that of a community of goods. The doctrine with regard to the relation of the sexes I rather acquiesced in than approved. I was disposed to maintain, as the Indian said, that woman is the weaker canoe, and to assert my marital prerogatives. But the equality of the sexes was asserted by nearly all my friends, and I remained generally silent on the subject, 
till some of the admirers of harriet martineau and margaret fuller began to scorn equality and to claim for woman superiority then i became roused and ventured to assert my masculine dignity it is remarkable that most reformers find fault with the christian law of marriage and propose to alter the relations which god has established both in nature and the gospel between the sexes and this is generally the rock on which they split women do not usually admire men who cast off their manhood or are unconscious of the rights and prerogatives of the stronger sex and they admire just as little those strong-minded women who strive to excel only in the masculine virtues i have never been persuaded that it argues well for a people when its women are men and its men women yet i trust i always honored and always shall honor woman i raise no question as to woman's equality or inequality with man for comparisons cannot be made between things not of the same kind woman's sphere and office in life are as high as holy as important as man's but different and the glory of both man and woman is for each to act well the part assigned to each by almighty god the saint simonian writings made me familiar with the idea of a hierarchy and removed from my mind the prejudices against the papacy generally entertained by my countrymen their proposed organization i saw might be good and desirable if their priests their supreme father and mother could really be the wisest the best not merely the nominal but the real chiefs of society yet what security have i that they will be their power was to have no limit save their own wisdom and love but who would answer for it that these would always be an effectual limit how were these priests or chiefs to be designated and installed in their office by popular election but popular election often passes over the proper man and takes the improper then as to the assignment to each man of a capital proportioned to his capacity to begin life with what certainty is there that the rules of strict right will be followed that wrong will not often be done both voluntarily and involuntarily are your chiefs to be infallible and impeccable still the movement interested me and many of its principles took firm hold of me and held me for several years in a species of mental thraldom insomuch that i found it difficult if not impossible either to refute them or to harmonize them with other principles which i also held or rather which held me and in which i detected no unsoundness yet i imbibed no errors from the saint simonians and i can say of them as of the unitarians they did me no harm but were in my fallen state the occasion of much good to me End of section 32